Jordan, where he acted as the Deputy Chief of Mission. Fast forward again to 1991 to 1994, where he became the U.S. Kuwait uh, Ambassador to Kuwait um, during the Gulf War. So those of you who are in my class, this is, to ta this is the time to ask those questions <laughs> about all those covert operations and, and, and various details that uh, you really don't know that much about. 1994 mm. to 1997, he became the Deputy Permanent Representative of the U.S. to the U.N. 1997 to 2000, he became the Director General of the Foreign Service and the Director of Personnel for the Department of State. From 2000 to 2001, he uh, vacationed, I'm sorry, he went to uh, Australia as the U.S. Ambassador. And then for his final post from 2001 to 2004, he enjoyed his last amba ambassadorship to the Kingdom of Jordan. To accompany such an illustrious career um, are a number of distinguished awards. So I'll name just a few again. Two international de decorations. The first, the Kuwait Decoration Medallion Special Class from His Highness the Emir of Kuwait, Sheikh Jabir al Sabah. And the second was the Order of Istiqlal, First Class from His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan. Ambassador Ghanim also received the Presidential Distinguished Service Award in 2000. In 2004, Secretary of State Colin Powell awarded him the Secretary of State's <coughs> Distinguished Service Award for his work in Jordan. If these aren't enough, the ambassador also was honored with two Presidential Meritorious uh, Service Awards in 1990 for his public service as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, and in 1991 for his service as Deputy Assistant Director of State. So what I hope you see is the valuable resource that we have in front of us and how fortunate we are that he's come to Villanova. He will be speaking tonight on um, U.S. military intervention in Iraq, costs, costs and consequences. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Benin. Thank you very much. Um, I hate introductions. Um, in the end, we're all mortals, and we, we come and go. Um, but thank you, Hibba. It was very nice of you to do that. You know, I should all, tell all of you to start with that um, she mentored me when I left the uh, Foreign Service and started my academic career. She had the office next door to me the first year or two that I was there. And her advice and guidance to me uh, is advice and guidance that I am still using today uh, in teaching my students. So if they don't like it, I just blame her and say they have to come up to Villanova to find her because but, uh, I've, I've always been indebted to her and I'm just delighted to be with you all today and, 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 um, and talk. I, I do want to uh, examine the consequences uh, of the United States military intervention in Iraq as we reflect on the 10th anniversary of that action. In fact, it was uh, 10 years ago earlier this week that the famous view of the statue coming down in Baghdad uh, actually took place. Yet my, uh, my thoughts go back to uh, a different uh, point in time, to a meeting in the Oval Office uh, with the President, uh, President Bush, in the summer of 2002. Now that's months before the invasion, uh, which occurred in 2003. I was there when King Abdullah of Jordan raised uh, Iraq with President Bush. I had flown to Washington with the king on his plane, as, as often was my opportunity, and he'd come back and he sat next to me or across from me and said, you know, Mr. Master, I, uh, I think I, I need to talk to the president about Iraq. Well, look, I'm an ambassador of the United States, not ambassador of Jordan, and I wasn't going to tell the king what to tell my president. And he asked me, well, what do you think I should do? I said, well, I think you know, you should raise whatever it is you feel that it's necessary to raise. He said, well, I don't think he's going to like what I have to say, but uh, I said, look, your, your Highness, you and the President have a very good relationship. I would say you tell him what you think you have to tell him. I mean, that's, that's it. Now, I'd already sent my cable as an ambassador right to the White House saying, here are the issues that I think the King is likely to raise, and Iraq was, was on there. So, let me go fast forward now to the Oval Office. This is just a picture that gives you a certain sense of it. And let me run through this conversation that I'm recollecting. The, um, 
The king comes in, he sits down, as you see here, and chairs shared. The, the president in one chair, the king in the other, and the president. Well, Your Majesty, what do you want to talk about today? Squirm, wiggle. The king doesn't like to tell people things he thinks they're not going to like. He squirmed a little bit. He said, well, Mr. President, um, I'd like to talk about Iraq. Good, let's talk about Iraq. Um, well, Mr. President, you know, Iraq is a, is a violent place. It, 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 the Iraqis are not like other Arabs. I mean, if you look at their history, when there's problems, blood is in the street. They, they kill each other. There's fighting and things are, are really bad. And he said, you know, it, Iraq is just a huge plain. Its armies just sweep into it. But it's really hard to get out. He said, you know, Syria is like a swamp. It's, a, it's kind of a tar pit. It's, um, and he got quag, as in quagmire. Quag out. Your majesty. And then he did the president. And with his finger in, in, the, in the king's chest. Your majesty. God didn't put you on your throne or me in this office not to make hard decisions. No, sir, Ray. I won't have one of my successors once, twice removed say, if only George Bush hadn't taken him out when he could. No, sir, Ray. Hum. He does that. He turns his back completely to the king. He does make that hum sound. And there are gasps from the Jordanian side over here who've never heard their king talked to by anybody, much less the president of the United States of America. And if you know anything about the culture of the region, you've heard about throwing shoes. The president didn't do that. But putting his back to the king is as insulting as anything one could do. It took him a while to get back where he was looking straight out the Oval Office window. I was just trying to look small. <laughs> the king changed the subject. Well, there you go. So it began. Simply stated, there is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he has amassed them to use against our friends. <clears throat> Fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. <coughs> By my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. Well, over 100,000 American troops, plus supporting coalition forces, quickly defeated the Iraqi military, as you know, and occupied Iraq. Saddam escaped, was later caught, tried, executed. The military victory did not produce peace, security, or prosperity, but chaos, insecurity, and economic collapse. Ultimately, as a result of the enormous effort and considerable, I would say, political cliffmanship, a constitution in Iraq was finally adopted, elections held, and Iraqi government installed. Yet over 6,000 American military and civilians were killed. Another 100,000 were wounded or suffered from war-related conditions. Between 2 and 2.8 million Iraqis were displaced internally, and another half million fled the country. <laughs> Estimates of Iraqis killed 
range from a very a low figure of 125,000 to over a quarter of a million. Another 350,000 are estimated to have been wounded. Minorities that were a part of the fabric of the state have been forced to abandon villages and ancient communities for lives, lives in exile as a result of post-Saddam ethnic cleansing. For example, 6% of Iraq's population prior to the invasion was Christian, many going back 2,000 years. That number today is only 3%. U.S. military action and subsequent occupation of Iraq may ultimately cost the American taxpayer $2 trillion, of which $800 billion represents near-term costs that have already been expended and have already been documented. The remaining $1.2 trillion is a conservative estimate for future interest payments on the money that we borrowed to pay for the war and for health care, disability, and other payments to veterans of the war. Other estimates of that health care and interest payment cost go much higher. In fact, the Woodrow Wilson Center, just since I originally drafted this, issued a document or paper saying that the costs were likely to be more in the neighborhood of $3 trillion. Now, I'm not today going to go into a discussion of the frustrating and lengthy process by which we got from the day of military victory to the day that we finally withdrew U.S. combat forces from Iraq, which was at the end of 2011. What I want to focus on today is the impact, the consequences of our military intervention. I'm going to look at the consequences for Iraq itself, on the interregional relationships as they are today in comparison to 10 years ago, and on the U.S. position in the Middle East as a result of, of this intervention. Before our intervention in Iraq, Iraq was a state dominated by its minority Sunni population, more especially by, by the person of Saddam Hussein himself, right? His clan, his cronies, his relatives, and his tribal associates. He controlled all instruments of power, the Ba'ath Party, the Iraqi military, and its intelligence apparatus. His use of terror was key to maintaining power. The structure of the state may have had a constitution, a parliament, and elections, but they were all a facade, a facade and a platform for the glorification of Saddam himself. Now, the three Kurdish provinces in the northern part of Iraq were essentially outside the government's control uh, following Saddam's defeat uh, in Kuwait in 1991. U.S., French, British coalition forces established what were called no-fly zones and also no-drive zones to thwart the efforts of Saddam Hussein to reassert the Iraqi central government authority over these Kurdish areas. In the south, the Baghdad government ruthlessly put down an insurrection of its Shia population killing approximately 60,000 rebels and suspected opponents. By June of 1991, Saddam had restored his control over central and southern Iraq and resumed his customary policies of oppression and discrimination. Now, Iraq of 2013 is not the Iraq of 2003 or of 1991. Today, the dominant actors on the political scene are representatives of the long oppressed Shia population, approximately 55 percent of Iraq's population. The Kurds are active players in the Iraq federal system, supporting various factions as it serves their interest, but in fact their attention is focused primarily on maintaining an autonomous region in the north. The new Iraq has a constitution excruciatingly negotiated over a three-week period under great pressure from the United States. It's a weak document written primarily by the winners, the those who had been in exile and those who had been oppressed, and who swore never again, never again to permit a dictator, authoritarian rule with no regard for democracy, its institutions and practices, and human rights. Now, that's not to say that the new Constitution actually uh, 
does in effect honor all of these ideals, but that was what it was aimed for. Now the Constitution has not been amended to correct the inequities and to some extent not fully implemented. A referendum to ratify the Constitution and three remarkably free and fair elections were held in 2005 and 2010 with large participation by the Iraqi electorate, especially after the Sunni population decided to participate in elections after having boycotted the previous ones. Yet today, that Sunni population in Iraq remains very estranged from the national body politic, accusing the Shia of a new form of dictatorship and claiming that they are being excluded from a rightful role in governing the country. Security is better today than it was in the period of the insurgency, which would have been between 2004, 2006. But violence is still a daily occurrence. And recently, unfortunately, we've seen the number and intensity of incidents have actually grown rather alarmingly. The Iraqi government has continued efforts begun under American auspices to develop, train, and deploy a security force and an intelligence apparatus they can bring violence under control, but those forces lack sufficient training, equ equipment, and mission. They are seriously at risk of politi politicalization, controlled by warlords, clans, and special interest groups, segregated by sect and ethnicity. For example, most Kurds belong to the Kurdish militia, the Peshmerga, loyal to the Kurdish political parties, not to the central government. A flashpoint of particular concern are the territories under dispute by the Kurdish regional authority and the central government of Baghdad. And these territories include the very rich and important oil city region of Kirkuk. Frankly, it's not clear who would be the victor if there were, if there were in, fact, in fact, fighting between the forces of the Peshmerga and the central authority. More serious are accusations by Iraqis, Sunnis, and some Shia that large segments of the military are coming under the direct control of the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Maliki, and not under the, the Ministry of Defense, as you would assume, and that he is using those, that military against the people uh, in the same way that Saddam used the military during his 35 years in power. Accusations by Sunnis and other groups that these security forces are exclusively the instrument of Shia power, or more personally, Maliki power, uh, undermine the credibility of the state. And they hamper efforts to build an inclusive political system. Now, one can point, however, to a very active political environment. An environment in which all factions and parties are able to express themselves in ways that were would have been possible to do under Saddam Hussein. There's no question that the Iraqi people um, find that their present situation is far better than it was before. But people are highly critical, even frankly to, to despair, I, I must say, with the inability of the government 10 years after the fall of Saddam to create a secure and stable political and social environment, or frankly, just to provide basic services like electricity and water, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, Iraq's regional role and influence uh, have changed dramatically since 2003. Prior to the overthrow of Saddam, Iraq's neighbors viewed the Sunni-led country as an important bulwark against Shiite and Persian Iran. Although international sanctions had effectively crippled Iraq's military capability, Iraq's neighbors, including Iran and Saudi Arabia, assessed Iraq as either a strong ally or a formidable enemy. Today, Iraq represents a completely new type of threat to the region. On the one hand, Neighbors fear continued instability in Iraq and the potential that it has for spilling over the borders into their territory. On the other hand, several neighbors worry that democracy in Iraq will succeed, frankly, and provide an unwanted example for those under Islamic 
or monarchical rule. Moreover, all the parties see Iraq as a weak state now in which outsiders compete for influence. And given Iraq's pivotal, pivotal, pivotal sorry, geostrategic location in the heartland of the region, no neighbor wants another to become the dominant power in Iraq. Most specifically, I'm referring to Iran and Saudi Arabia, a competition which I'm going to address a bit later. But it does pertain to Syria and to Turkey as well. Let's look quickly at Iran. Outside Iraq, no other country in the region has seen as much change as it considers its national interest in Iran. For over 50 years, the Iranian-Iraqi relationship has been adversarial, often at war, rarely at peace. Under the Shah, Iran saw Iraq as a, th as a threat to its security, as Iraq dramatically increased its arms purchases from the Soviet Union. The Islamic Revolution in Iran only exacerbated the hostility. Following the revolution, Saddam saw both a threat to his regime and an opportunity to assert Iraq's dominance in the region. The Islamic Revolution threatened to destabilize his regime in Iraq by appealing to the Shia in Iraq in the southern part of the country. The opportunity lay in a much weakened Iran, busy purging the country's pro-American military. Saddam calculated it would be easy to prove once and for all that Iran was not the power in the, in the region that it claimed to be, but that Iraq was, in fact, supreme. He was tragically wrong. The result was a disastrous eight-year war that resulted in million casualties on both sides, including the deaths of hundreds of thousands, the injury to countless more. Very few families in either country were left untouched by the war. For Iran and Iranians, Iraq remained the arch enemy and a constant threat to the survival of the Islamic Republic. This changed completely in 2003 with Saddam's defeat by U.S. forces. And Importantly, the dismantlement of the Iraqi military. The U.S. achieved for Iran what Iran had not been able to do in decades. Now, faced with an entirely different constellation of power in Iraq, what would Iran's policy be? I would say that overall Iran had two objectives that require, frankly, a very careful and judicious use of its assets and interventions. Iran's top priority was to ensure that the new Iraq would remain united but under a weak, pro-Iranian government that could never re-emerge as a threat to Iran. But secondly, it did not want to see a degree of instability that might spread to and destabilize Iran itself. Now, initially, after our military intervention, Iran feared that this huge U.S. military presence along its borders was a prelude to U.S. military intervention in Iraq, and in Iran itself. And therefore, they were being very careful and cautious. As the situation inside Iraq deteriorated, however, and the Iranians concluded that the U.S. was now mired in Iraq, they grew less concerned about U.S. action. They intensified efforts to build relationships with a variety of factions, all of whom were competing with each other in Iraq. In fact, they were actually willing to support groups that were actually in opposition with each other because they wanted to be sure that they had a relationship with whatever Shia faction or factions ultimately ended up on top. Since 2003, the Iranians have continued to develop close ties, particularly with the Shia political factions, and their militia, <clears throat> many of which were hosted in Iran in the 1980s. Iran's interest in the Shia community in Iraq is a natural development, given that Iran is Shia, and there are deep religious, cultural, and even family ties between the Shia in Iraq and the Shia in Iran. Yet all is not easy for Iran, so let's don't go too far in that extreme. 
While the Shia parties form the largest group, uh, grouping in, in Iraq's political sphere, they are not united and, in fact, compete with each other for power and influence. Iran's objective, therefore, has had to be to convince them to remain united behind Maliki, the prime minister, a Shia, lest other groups unite to oust the Shiite government itself. Iran, however, is not all powerful in trying to influence the politics inside Iraq. Recently, one extremist Shia faction, led by a person who's become rather infamous in time, Muqtadr Sadr, joined Sunni leaders in parliament in actually voting a, a, a no-confidence motion and calling for the resignation of the prime minister. Muqtadr Sadr is an influential cleric with a formidable militia, frankly, supported by Iran at times, but he doesn't always follow the guidance from the East. The Iranians have also been far less successful influencing the most senior Shia cleric in Iraq who resides in Najaf and leads a significant worldwide Shia collective, and I'm referring here to the Iranian-born Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani. Iran's influence in Iraq extends beyond the political sphere. There's an important, as I say, religious tie, the four holiest sites of Shia Islam, Najaf, Karbala, Samara, and a section of Baghdad known as Sadr City <coughs> are located in Iraq. They're the objects of Shia veneration and pilgrimage. As many as a million Iranian pilgrims Thank you. join Iraqi Shia in flocking to these sites as location of the tombs of Shia imams and martyrs, including the Imam Ali, the son-in-law of the prophet and the fourth caliph, and his son, Imam Hussein. Perhaps a brief aside at this point is, is important to understand the Sunni uh, Shia cleavage, which is at the root of much of the turmoil and the competition in the region today. This cleavage centers on the question of who was the legitimate successor or caliph to the Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad died, the Prophet Muhammad died in 632 without de designating a successor. And on his death, the companions of the Prophet met and selected a close friend of the Prophet to be his successor. Others in the community rejected the validity of this selection process, believing that the only rightful succession to the Prophet was through the bloodline of the Prophet, specifically to Ali, the Prophet's son-in-law. The Prophet had no sons directly, but Ali married uh, the daughter. Uh, of the prophet. Today, those people who think in terms of the bloodline as the proper succession are the people that we call Shia or followers of Ali. And the issue actually culminated in a, in a rather major battle called the Battle of Karbala in 680, where Hussein, the prophet's grandson, fought against a rival claiming their right to rule and was killed. And Hussein's martyrdom represents a very, very formative historical moment for Shiite Muslims. Uh, the results of this cleavage in early Islam have been felt throughout the subsequent 15 centuries. The Shia continued to reject the validity and authority of Sunni caliphs, the leaders of successive um, succeeding Islamic empires. They often fought these Sunni leaders, but over time they withdrew into their own communities Sunni or Orthodox Muslims saw the Shia as deviants, dividing the faith in direct contravention of the teachings of the Prophet. They interpreted the Shia rejection of authority as subversive and sought to isolate and discriminate, even eliminate, Shia communities and believers. The Wahhabi movement, which is known as it comes out of Saudi Arabia, and Sunni Salafi extremists labeled the Shia apostates or non-believers, persons having known the faith but have given it up and therefore subject to death as prescribed in the Koran. Wahhabi extremists twice sacked Karbala and laid siege to Najaf in the early 19th century. Iraqis today remember this. Now, I mean, it's, kind of, it's kind of an aside, but you know, we in America have a much, much different view of history 
than people in the Middle East. In Iraq and Iran, events that occurred centuries ago are described or raised as if they happened last night. So we have to look at 2013 with an eye on 680, which I was just referring to, the battle, and 1501. The latter year was the date the then Shah of Iran decided to convert to Shia Islam and, and his whole population, by the way. And since then, Iran has promoted itself as a protector of the Shia populations throughout the Middle East and beyond. Sunni governments, in turn, have concluded that their Shia populations are ultimately loyal to Iran, therefore are fifth columns, subversive elements, to be closely monitored and controlled. Now, it, this is a contestable accusation, I would quickly add, since most Shia in the Gulf are Arabs, not Persians. They've lived in these countries for more than a thousand years. They essentially deplore the Islamic Republic of Iran. And most of them, the, the, these Shia living in the Gulf, are followers of Ayatollah Sistani that I mentioned earlier, who has a completely different view of the way Shia Islam should be dealt with than does Ayatollah Khomeini and his uh, philosophy of having both temporal and political power. Fast forward to the present and how the U.S. occupation of Iraq and Sunni Shia cleavage have produced dramatically unintended consequences. Now, now, look, clearly the United States did not create this cleavage, I mean, that erupted into the civil war in, in Iraq. The U.S. was hardly around in 680. Let's give ourselves a break here. Uh, but our toppling of a Sunni-dominated political order and then espousing a political transition that stressed majority rule in a country where the Shia had a majority, resulted in a complete reversal of roles of these two groups in the political system. Sunnis, who had ruled Iraq since its founding and who believed they had a right to rule, were suddenly the underdogs and the outs. The Shia, who had been suppressed and for centuries saw themselves outside this, the political power, saw themselves as victims, now found themselves dominant. The psychological consequences of both, on both of these groups are now factors influencing both their reactions to each other and to the policies that the new Iraq pursues regionally. The Shia rise to power in Iraq has had far-ranging consequences in the region. Let's talk about this impact of the Shia awakening. Soon after the Shia-dominated government emerged in Iraq, King Abdullah of Jordan, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, both warned of a Shia crescent that included Iran, Iraq, Syria, and the Hezbollah areas of southern Lebanon. It is far more than a minor concern for many other capitals in the region. Saudi anxieties stem from many factors. Saudi Arabia, the largest Sunni Arab state in the Persian Gulf, has long seen Iran as a competitor and a threat. And it has every reason to be concerned. I mean, Iran historically has made no secret of its ambitions, nay, it's right, to be the preeminent power in the Gulf. After all, they say, it's called the Persian Gulf. Immediately following the revolution in Tehran, Ayatollah Khomeini called for the overthrow of the El Saud family, labeling it an apostate family. Now, Saudi paranoia toward rising Iranian power and influence simply went off the scale with the ascension of Shia to power in Baghdad, a state that had been firmly in the Sunni camp and therefore in the anti-Iranian camp. There's no doubt in the Saudi minds and that of several other Arab countries that the new Iraqi government is nothing more than the surrogate of Iran. The Saudis would have nothing to do with its prime minister, Nur al-Maliki, and their personal reasons as well as political reasons, refusing to normalize relations or provide the new Iraqi government with any support. And in doing so, the Saudis, in fact, have played right into the Iranian hands because they have abdicated a counterweight role 
to the enormous Iranian influence in Iraq. The Saudis also see Iran as seeking to supplant Saudi Arabia in its traditional role as the protector of Islam, even though two of the holiest sites of, of Islam, both Mecca and Medina, are in Saudi Arabia. But no less important is Saudi concern about its own Shia minority in the eastern province of the kingdom, where incidentally are located all of its oil fields, right? Shia there have long felt oppressed, certainly mistreated by the Wahhabi clergy. I mentioned to you already the Wahhabi <laughs> attitude about them as being apostates. Uh, oppressed, mistreated, kept out of the political order. There have been demonstrations through the years, but violence has increased dramatically in recent times. Saudi Arabia's Shia communities are certainly emboldened by the success of their co-religionists in Iraq, simply asking to be treated fairly and equally to other Saudi citizens. The Saudi government, however, sees the Iranian hand behind the disorder and publicly charges Iran with instigating the trouble. Now, the same concerns flared last year in the so-called Arab Spring, when Shia and liberal Sunnis in neighboring Bahrain took to the streets demanding the very same things, justice, equal rights, economic opportunities. Unlike Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, in, in fact, the other Arab Gulf states, Bahraini Shia form a majority of the population, while the ruling Sunnis represent only about 30%. So about 70% of the Bahraini population is Shia. Sunnis from the Al Khalifa ruling family dominate the government, the parliament, the military, and the security forces. From the first demonstrations, the Bahraini government and Riyadh both accused Iran of fomenting the trouble. The Saudi government feared its worst nightmare was unfolding. Iranians crossing the Persian Gulf, to Bahrain, which they once claimed, and ensconcing themselves only miles from the shore of the Saudi eastern province and its Shia population. They dispatched a military force to Bahrain, ostensibly to protect the economic infrastructure, but more specifically to assist the Arab Sunni monarchy maintain order while thwarting Iranian perceived hegemonic ambitions. Throughout the Gulf region, fears surrounding rising Shia influence and expanding Iranian power drive decisions and the actions of Sunni governments. Nowhere is this more dramatically seen than in Syria. Saudi Arabia and Qatar actively supporting the resistance to the Assad regime, a strong ally of Iran. Their great hope is to topple the Alawite regime, install some form of autocratic or Islamic rule, and thus significantly undermine Iranian influence in the Middle East as a whole. Now, how do we interpret Baghdad's policies toward the Syrian situation? Rather unusual. The Iraqi government has been reluctant to stop or inspect flights of Iranian aircraft taking material of whatever nature to Syria, though in the last week they've actually stopped three, which has been a quite a change. The U.S. is certainly not happy with the Maliki government's policy on Syria, and in other words, not thwarting the Iranian assistance to Assad. But is it Iranian influence, as is often alleged, that is forcing Iraq's hand, or is there some other cause? And I would submit that it's far more complicated than just Iranian influence. Certainly Iran is applying pressure, no doubt about that. But the government of of uh, Iraq uh, finds itself in a very interesting and difficult dilemma. There's no love lost in Baghdad for the Assad regime. I mean, after all, that's the regime that permitted jihadist fighters to enter Iraq during the height of the civil strife, fighting on the Sunni side, putting the bombs that kill huge numbers of Shia, right? Yet the Shia government fears that the successor regime in Damascus could well be a Sunni gov government dominated by either the Muslim Brotherhood or, still worse, the more radical Salafis. History once again raises its head. 
Where did the army that defeated Imam Hussein in the seventh century come from? Damascus. And by the way, from whence came the horde that sacked and destroyed Najaf and Karbala in 1804, Saudi Arabia? If the Saudis and other Sunni Arab governments perceive threats from Shia-dominated Iran and Iraq, then I assure you Baghdad feels equally threatened by the Sunni Arab states. What I've been describing is, is no less than a major, major repositioning of alliances and power in the Middle East. What we're seeing are countries that see their national interests, as they perceive them, under threat. And they're working in a variety of ways to enhance their position vis-a-vis -vis those that are threatening. Iran and the Shia populations in Iraq and the Gulf tend to be seen as one of the clusters. Arab Sunni governments, especially the Gulf Arab states, are seen as another. Yet within these groups, there are real affinities and there are also divisions. I want to take just a moment to talk about the Kurds uh, because they are an important factor at play. I mentioned them earlier. They're another group player in the regional kaleidoscope. They're a very unique ethnic group. They're not Arab and they're not Persian. They inhabit a region that includes significant territories in four different states, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. They are the largest single minority in the Middle East without their own state. While some Kurdish groups do in fact talk about a state, at present the Kurds find themselves in a position of strength within Iraq. Having been manipulated in the past by others, they now have considerable influence on the Iraqi political scene. And I would, would say, based even on conversations last week with a visiting Kurdish delegation in Washington, they will stay inside a unified Iraq as long as they can continue to do what they want to do in their parts of Iraq. And that has to do with oil and selling oil and keeping the revenue for themselves. Turkey, a brief word about Turkey. You know, as various states in the region are jockeying for influence and power, Turkey remains focused almost entirely on the Kurdish question in view of the very large Kurdish minority in Turkey. But Turkey is also wary, wary of Iran's enhanced influence in Iraq. Turkey historically has had an interest in Iraq. The Turkmen minority, also in a very important trading relationship. And so as Turkey deals with its own internal debate over the role of Islam in the state, it watches carefully the unfolding events in both Iraq and Syria with the possible implications that they will have on the Turkish domestic scene. Well, where then is the United States in this melange of affairs? What can we say about the U.S. and its position in the region 10 years after its dramatic, if not cataclysmic, military invention in Iraq. First, and I believe the most important observation, is that American power is seen today as far less decisive than it was prior to our intervention. Vice President Cheney and other advocates of our intervention argued that American power was unassailable. Other countries were invited to join the coalition to topple uh, Saddam. But, and it, but if they chose not to join, they would find that the U.S. was going to do it anyway, unilaterally, and frankly, we didn't need them. Well, if anything, America's inability to maintain order and instability in Iraq after the liberation overshadowed our brilliant military success. And it demonstrated the limits of American power rather than proving its invincibility. Nowhere was this lesson highlighted more to our detriment than in Iran. At first, as I said, Iran feared America's military presence along its borders. But the rising instability in Iraq presented Iran with new opportunities to interfere and to exploit. With U.S. forces bogged down in Iraq, America's regional allies began to question the reliability of U.S. support. With our withdrawal at the end of 2011, these same allies now question our commitment to their security. And finally, 
terrorist and insurgent groups operating in Iraq, many with Iranian support, devised methods to undermine and discredit the credibility of American superpower. America's intervention, again, I would stress, revealed the vulnerabilities of a conventional force operating inside an insurgent environment. But look, reality is different, however, and I, I want to end with some brief observations which shed some conditionality on what I just said. Um, first and foremost, the U.S. does remain the sole superpower in the world. This is not questioned. And the difficulties dealing with terrorist attacks on the conventional forces, they don't diminish America's military capacity to act against and to defeat our enemies. In the Middle East and in the Gulf region itself, the U.S. relationship with our Arab, Arab allies remains strong. They may question us, but they continue to recognize that a strong U.S. presence is essential for Gulf security and stability. There really isn't an alternative. And secondly, while we're apt to see current events as a pattern of significant change, and I do believe uh, that there has been considerable change, we must not overlook the continuities. Excuse me. For example, while Iranian influence in Iraq today may appear far-reaching, and some would say catastrophic, there are other factors at play in the Iraqi-Iranian relationship, and one is ethnic. Iranians are Persian, and Iraqis, including the Shia, are Arab. I could tell you a lot about this attitude of one to the other. This historical cleavage between the two and the difference in religious practices and even in culture are real. They remain. Further, let's not forget that Iraq is a separate state. It has its own interests, and those interests often conflict with those of Iran. Oil pricing, oil production come to mind almost immediately. But water is even a more likely issue of conflict. Iraq will pursue its own national interests wherever it takes it, even if it means altercations with Iran. Now, 10 years is a, is a mere snippet in time. Let's face it, I've talked about 680, I've talked about 1501, 632, and sort of compressed them all into about 40 minutes. But 10 years isn't a very long time. And so while it's easy to attribute many, if not all, of the current woes in the region to the U.S. military intervention in Iraq or to Iranian meddling, it wouldn't be accurate. Our destruction of the Ba'athist regime, our insistence on an Iraq divided into Sunni, Arab, Shia, and Kurdish interests did open what I would call a Pandora's box, including the reemergence of sectarian and ethnic political interests, but we did not create them. Right? It is true of the Kurdish question as well, and the historic precedent of Persian-Arab competition. They're historic, and they've been there for centuries. They far predate the U.S. intervention. I do believe, to be very honest with you, that public perceptions of how we dealt with Iraq after the military victory are likely to remain vivid for a very long time, particularly in the minds of, of Iraqis. We do not fare well in that regard. History, history, as I said, lives well beyond its a normal lifespan. Iraqis will long remember Abu Ghraib, for example, even if we do not. If there is one lesson I think we should learn from this experience, it is this. One must recognize the limits of an outside power, even one as strong as the United States, to control and determine events outside of our borders. In the end, the people who live in the region will define their own future. We can advise, we can lead, we can support, but they will ultimately determine their own course forward. Thank you.